Sporting Journal Radio, presented by Onyx. All right, this is Sporting Journal Radio. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thank you for tuning in on this station on the network by demand at sportingjournalradio.com, or maybe you're watching this on YouTube. Thank you very much. We had a spirited debate last week here on the, well, spirited debate. I don't, we, we had an interesting discussion last week here on the radio show. Uh, Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart with us here too. And it, it, uh, it was, it was a, about a topic that was brought uh, to my attention. And then uh, I know some people over in North Dakota. I reached out to Game and Fish, I ended up doing an interview with Greg Power, who uh, has been at the at the heart of the the topic on the game and fish side, and the person that brought this this question to me is Jeremy Olson, and he joins us now here on the show. Jeremy, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, and uh, thank you very much for having me on. We're talking about a potential new fee structure for fishing tournaments in North Dakota, and I I really hadn't been following it. I haven't lived in North Dakota for uh, for about 12, 13 years now, and um, I didn't really fish tournaments or anything while I was over there. So I wasn't really paying much attention to the, the tournament scene. And now uh, this topic is, is really brewing. Uh, currently, right now, it's at legislature. And apparently, it's been going on for a few years. I didn't realize that, uh, Jeremy. But this, is, uh, this has been a topic that, that you've, that's been near and dear to you for a long time. Yeah, I, I've been working on this for, I think, going on 12 years now. Um, and and I think what's important for everybody to understand is I'm not a tournament guy. I'm 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 the kid that grew up camping 12 months out of the year in North Dakota, and my dad didn't fish, and um, and so uh, never had a fancy boat. Our first boat that we bought is the one I'm still using. It's a 16 foot bluefin with a 25 horse Johnson, and um, I fished my first tournament when I was in high school, which is a high school. Uh, a $5 entry fee ice fishing tournament. And I got a hundred bucks and thought that was kind of cool. And then, uh, you know, about 12 years ago, I started fishing some charity tournaments with my kids here in North Dakota. And that's, that's my extent of, of being a tournament angler, um, self-taught angler. And uh, so everything we're going to be talking about today is stuff I've learned in the last 12 years since I, I moved back to North Dakota in 2003, even though I was raised here. So the, basically at the heart of the issue is that some tournaments some fishing tournaments were paying uh more money than than other tournaments and the money wasn't necessarily going to what uh what everybody thought it was going to so uh, explain to me what your opposition was to the way things were being done in north dakota so to get there we got to take a, a quick history lesson and, and mr power covered that pretty well in uh, your last podcast um but for Almost 40 years ago, some people wanted to have a governor's cup. And back then they set up a rule that uh, you could keep 15% of the money as an organizer of a charity event. Only charity events were legal in North Dakota at the time. You had to pay a 10% conservation fee based on entry fees paid or participation fees for that tournament. And you had to give away 75% of the money to, to participants. And, and that rule has pretty much been unchanged with one exception since 1984. And that one exception is back in the 90s, uh, the pro, pro Walleye Tour, PWT, came to North Dakota. And as is everywhere in the country, if you make it to a national championship, there's no entry fee. And a group of people were frustrated that the Pro Walleye Tour um, didn't have an entry fee to get around that's 10% conservation fee. So back in 1994, they put in a rule that said, if there's no entry fee and you give away money or prizes, you have to pay a $10,000 conservation fee. Um, and that is, and that's the way the rules are to this day. Um, one of the sticking points was at some point in time in the nineties, um, a city and the game and fish negotiated a $5,000 cap. So um, from mid 90s until 2020 um most tournaments in north dakota were only paying five thousand dollars regardless of what those entry fees or that ten percent would have been so does that make sense as far as a history lesson on this yeah but was there something about that wasn't published like nobody knew that there was a five thousand dollar cap yeah um most people didn't know there was a cap partially because they didn't have to and they never ever got to that amount of money uh but there's places there's organizations in North Dakota who were paying anywhere from two to four and a half thousand dollars over that cap. And uh, yeah, the, you, you got a rough chart there. Um, and what you see there is the numbers from 2022. And what you're seeing is the variations in fishing tournament fees 
by size of tournament. And so that's a huge, um, huge variation there. Um, and, and I, I, I think, uh, we actually have some more current numbers than that, Brett. And, uh, so in 2022, um, zero to 50 tournaments or zero to 50 participants, uh, there was 54 events in North Dakota that were, that fall under that category. And that's 40% of all tournaments in 2022. And, um, and there was an $1,100 difference in the cheapest ent- or permit fee and the most expensive. So, and so that's, that's where some of the rub came in is there was no consistency on the impact to a fishery or a boat ramp or parking, um, but there's huge differences. And when you get into those numbers on the top end of that or the bottom end of that graph that you were showing, there's a $9,000 difference between uh, tournaments of 401 participants and greater. And that's, is it, is that a lot of that has to do with uh, higher entry fees? Yeah. Or just- well, it's, it's about entry fees. So the tournament that pays the most money in conservation fees right now in North Dakota is the Devil's Lake Ice Fishing Tournament, which is a fundraiser for the Devil's Lake Fire Department. And um, their entry fee is only $4. But they had close to 24,000 people pay a $4 entry fee. Mm-hmm. And so they have to pay $9,600. This year in 2023, they paid $9,600 in conservation fees. And remember that 75% rule, they have to buy prizes or give away cash of 75% of all the money they raised. Now, where where this gets a little crazy and, and where it doesn't make sense for just a, a citizen of North Dakota, like me, myself, a volunteer firefighter, um, former volunteer firefighter, is 19,000 people never fished that tournament that Devil's Lake had to pay that conservation fee on. And so, um, and fire departments are a pretty important thing for us to support in North Dakota. And so is conservation money going to a boat ramp in Porter? Yes. Nobody, nobody disagrees with that. Um, having the devil's Lake fire department, not be able to buy a new brush truck or outfit 10 people with fire gear. That's more important to me. And, yeah. and, and that's where the opposition to the current way of thinking is coming from. And that conservation fee that started because there was a, a big tournament in North Dakota in the in the nineties, and the locals were mad that all these pros were going to come and and the hammer first, the lake. No, it was the first tournament ever is what started the conservation fee, and that's the North Dakota Governor's Cup. Prior to nineteen eighty four, or in that oh, area, 80s. okay, in the eighties, there was no tournaments in North Dakota allowed because that was gambling with the fish, according to the people at the time, um, you know, I was, I was in second or third grade, so I didn't pay a lot of attention to it back then, <laughs> but, <Sure. laughs> but, but that's, that's where all this comes from is, and, and the opposition to our bill, uh, comes from what kind of what you were saying. There's, there's three groups of people that are upset with the bill that we brought forward. Um, and the one group of people is the people that don't want anybody from out of state coming and fishing in my, on my lake in my spot, you know, so it's the, not my spot, not my lake folks. There's a prejudice against out of state anglers in North Dakota um, and where it manifests itself uh, with the most harm is when we're talking about these conservation fees. The other group of people that's against this um, bill are the fishing clubs and organizations that are currently getting the money. Um, And it's not the cities, um, but like, uh, like we heard, most of these funds are passed through funds. So if I have hold a fishing tournament in Washburn, I have to write Game and Fish a check uh, for that 10% for the tournament I would hold. And then Washburn gets the check back. And, and so if we're only giving the money away to get it back, and then there's, there's some restrictions on that. So whatever we say to Game and Fish that that money has to go for, that's what it has to go for. And it has to be part of a fisheries project. It has to be part, you know, fish cleaning station, um, boat ramp access, something like that. Um, and the reality is when we were looking at what's it take, what what's the positives and the negatives to the way things are currently happening, um, there's way more negatives to the way things are happening. And um, I think one of the interesting stats here, let me grab, roughly 26% of groups in North Dakota that hold tournaments 
are outdoor clubs or sports clubs. And, um, you know, the people that support the Wild Turkey Federation want to raise some conservation dollars for turkeys. And there's Pheasants. Uh, Pheasants for the Future was a group that was very huge uh, for years. And, and, and the new bill allows 26% of roughly 26% of tournaments in North Dakota to keep 100% of their money for the conservation projects that they have. Ducks Unlimited can use that money for ducks, uh, duck projects and stuff. Educational groups, um, student angling groups can can keep 100% of their money uh, for for those conservation and education projects. And uh, and so the, it's one of the things that's kind of making me scratch my head is we we worked long and hard uh, over the last four or five years to come up with some legislation that didn't hurt the groups that were getting money currently and right now they're getting 10 percent under the new law they would they would have access to a hundred percent of those funds so people that might lose out on this conservation fee money <clears throat> could potentially hold their own tournament to raise that money and maybe well, even the, raise more uh 26 percent of these people already are holding their tournaments and have to give away 75 percent of their money yeah so so right now um, you know, and if, if what's the goal of your tournament? Well, our, our goal of our tournament is uh, uh, to just have fun and to get, bring in some money and give it out. And then you have that ability to do that. But um, if the goal of our tournament is to give rods and reels to kids, uh, one of the tournaments that our family's involved in, because my kids own a fishing tackle company, is the angler, young angler tournament that happens at Devil's Lake every year. Um, that tournament, the sole purpose is to take 80 kids out fishing, give them rods, reels, and tackle, and teach them how to fish. And currently, they're paying $600 in conservation fees to hold that tournament. And and that $600 that if it was not sent to Game and Fish and returned to the entity that uh, – and, and it's a circle. So – that money's given to Game and Fish. It goes back to a sports club in Devil's Lake who gives it to the Angler Young Angler Tournament. And it's just this rotating $600 that could be going to um, tackle and rods and reels for these young kids that we want to get into fishing. And that that's, that's a lot of gear. So this new bill, uh, if it's not a nonprofit fishing tournament, 75% of the entry fee would still go back? No, no. The new bill um, with the amendments, uh, originally the new bill said that uh, 100% of money for charities, nonprofits could go there. One of the amendments and agreements is everybody agreed that it doesn't matter if it's a nonprofit or um, a regular tournament, they can, they can handle how they're going to spend their money. And so, and part of the reason for that is, the goal was is that nobody would make money on that 75 percent um you know the, the goal was that nobody would make money off of a fishing tournament well most bigger tournaments where people are fishing for money are already giving out uh 75 80 percent and so you know this allows those tournaments to actually give away 100 percent to the participants you know if that's the purpose uh, a lot of convention and visitor bureaus want they don't, they're not worried about making money on the tournament. They want people to come and buy gas and tackle and food and stay in right. a restaurant. And, and so, um, you know, there's a huge economic impact to having these tournaments. And uh, so by limiting these tournaments, the, the bigger tournaments from coming into our state, uh, the economic impact is huge. And, um, and I guess that's what what kind of blew this thing up and the reason we're actually in the legislature is because two years ago during COVID, um, the North Dakota Game and Fish pulled that $5,000 cap that we were talking about earlier. And, and that made a tournament like the National Walleye Tour, the Masters Walleye Circuit, um, instead of those tournaments being a $5,000 tournament that Devils Lake Garrison or Bismarck had to pay for, because uh, um, we should maybe hop into that just a little bit people don't realize when you have a national event it's a fishing event it's no different than if we bring a concert or any other special event to our community if you want the national walleye tour to come to your town your town has to pay or a group of people need to get together and pay for them to come so in 
Minnesota, they have to, that group has to pay $250 to have the National Walleye Tour at, the, at that event. In Wisconsin, it's $25. In Michigan, it's free. In South Dakota, it's free. In Iowa, it's like $25 or $30. You know, it's, it's small amounts of money. If the national, yeah, you, you got the chart there and it's, it's really small amounts of money, correct? Um, so the National Walleye Tour is having an event, their first event uh, for 2023 in a week. Um, and if that event were going to be held in North Dakota, it would be right now, from what we know, $29,900 for the permit fee. Wow. <laughs> And and so and what people don't understand is the anglers don't pay twenty nine thousand nine hundred dollars, the National Walleye Tour doesn't pay twenty nine thousand nine hundred dollars. Devil's Lake, Garrison, Beulah, Hazen, Williston, Bismarck have to pay that money, and and you know uh, money's not running free in our country right now, yeah, and right. and so so they don't have that money, and um. And so it just, it isn't practical for those things. So for all intents and purposes, two years ago, there became this ban on um, tournaments, a national circuit tournaments. Uh, if you really want to get scary, um, then if we brought in a BASS Elite Series uh, this year, it would be $54,000 hmm. just, for, just for the permit fee. And then South Dakota was free last year. In South Dakota, it was free. Yeah, and South Dakota doesn't have a yeah the, the permit. They you, it, everybody still has to get your local permits. You know, a use for uh, you know, if you're using a state park and those things. We're not talking about those things. We're just talking the permit fee for the tournament. So I just want to back up because I am I looking at something that's outdated that says under yeah. Section Two Fishing Contest Number Two, it says a minimum of seventy-five percent of any entry or participation fee paid by the contestants must be returned to the contestants as cash or cash equivalent merchandise. Yeah, that. Um, yeah, so that uh, that amendment in the the House made an amendment to get rid of that okay. uh, across the board, and they got rid of the fifteen percent that you could keep. And so, so right now, charity or regular, um, you know, or we, regular they, can keep a hundred percent. Yeah, everybody can keep 100. That was one of the negotiations. The other negotiation was in the original bill, it was a $250 permit for a for-profit tournament and it was $75 for a non-profit or up to. And um, and the House of Representatives um, committee, um, um, the negotiations that happened between the Convention and Visitor Bureau's tourism and those and that committee agreed on a 25 up to $2,500 permit for and what they call out of state tournaments and and um how as do they a, determine that's what we're all trying to figure out because it what what truly is an out of state tournament you know in the national wildlife tour and the masters wildlife circuit 25 percent of those anglers are from north dakota and and those are anglers that will never get to compete on their home water ever well i was going to ask you that because in your testimony you said something about that how the century code restricts North Dakota residents from competing here in North, you know, there in North Dakota. Is, so, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. So um, a great example is the AIM Weekend Walleye Series. Uh, they hold five events in Minnesota, five events in Wisconsin, and five events in North Dakota. Um, those five events in North Dakota, it's a 10% conservation fee for the entry fees. Um, and for years, they, they were capped at that $5,000. Um, they've paid more than that in the last couple of years or and before that. Um, but then Minnesota, that's five times $250. In Wisconsin, that's five events times $25. And the way the AIM Weekend Walleye Series works is all of those anglers in three states are competing to be one of the top 10 in those three states to compete in a, na a free national championship where they're giving away hundred hundred and thirty five thousand dollars in cash and prizes um, but there's no entry fee and prior to 2020 um and prior to 2020 um that event was allowed to be in north dakota when they pulled the cap and went back they north dakota game and fish wants aim to pay ten thousand dollars for that free event to be in north dakota because of that rule from the 90s so this is 2023 is the fourth year now that the national championship is not in North Dakota, B, 
because nobody has this imaginary $10,000 for those anglers to compete in front of their home crowd. And, and, and I think that's sad. Um, it doesn't affect me, but why should somebody who's competed and, and earned the right to compete at home, not be able to compete at home? So, um, so, and that's, and that's one of the reasons for this bill. Um, um, I was the tournament director for the AIM Weekend Walleye Series in North Dakota for a handful of years. Um, um, but we lost so many anglers because nobody could compete at home. I, I, I lost my job because there wasn't enough anglers fishing in North Dakota to pay for me to be there. Um, my, my sons who own the fishing tackle business, like I said, sponsor some of those anglers. And as sponsors of, of anglers, North Dakota anglers, they can't have their anglers fish on their home water for a national championship. And, and it just it breaks my heart as a resident that we're allowing that to happen in North Dakota. And that's why we brought this. That's another one of the reasons we brought this bill forward is it's it's not it's not because we don't like conservation. It's we want kids to be able to fish high school events. We want yeah. uh, professional anglers and and electricians and oil workers and stuff who earn the right to fish on, on the national stage to be able to fish at home. And so that's that's why I spent four or five years writing bill, House Bill fifteen thirty eight, um, and that's that's why we are where we're at. And one of the other changes uh, in the past, now any tournament had to pay that, right? But now if the entry fee is less than fifty dollars, or if there's fewer than fifty participants or fifteen boats, if the participants are under the age of nineteen. Or if it's an online tournament like a fish donkey tournament, not limited to a single body of water, then you don't need a don't need a permit. Under the new rules, yeah, and and the, the exemption for youth angling there is not for tournaments; it's for youth activities. So, one of the things that's been kind of quirky in North Dakota is um, if you wanted to take uh, fifty kids out and teach them how to fish, you currently under the rules and the way they're administered, we have to get a permit to teach. 50 kids how to fish oh really uh, yeah and uh we don't have to pay a conservation fee and there and 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 to be fair to north dakota game of fish they give a lot of exemptions they give a lot of permits out for for things that they uh they give exemptions or permits so you don't have to so you can part- do a participation in something um but but it's why should there be exemptions for taking kids fishing you know, and, and that's that's our viewpoint on it. If um, and and if we're looking at high school angling, um, parents in a town shouldn't have to get a permit to go practice on a Thursday night um, with ten or fifteen boats in Washburn because we have a boat ramp. We're all going to be fishing there anyway. We shouldn't have to get a permit because we're doing a, a high school youth activity. Um, and and so that's that's what that carve out is for there or that exemption. Um, if we're going to put a hundred boats on Lake Audubon and have a high school fishing tournament, um, you'll notice that we still have to get a permit under this rule. Uh, Jeremy Olson is our guest, and we got to take a break from the radio show. We're going to continue this uh, discussion on the podcast, though. So if you're listening on the radio and you want to hear more, uh, go to sportingjournalradio.com or download the podcast wherever you get podcasts or watch this video on YouTube. Uh, Real quick, before we transition to the podcast, Jeremy, you're obviously in favor of Bill 1538. For anyone listening out there, uh, what should they do? When, When do you think we might find a resolution on this and can people, you know, do you want people to contact their representatives? What, what do you want to, what's, what's your message for people? So right now, um, I'm a horrible, I'm a horrible politician. I want people to be honest and let their, right now it's let your senators know, um, um, 10 o'clock on Thursday, the 16th is the, the Senate hearing, uh, between for the, uh, energy and natural resources committee. And there's six guys there that will be taking a look at our bill and hearing our case. Um, those guys need to hear from you if you're for or against this bill and, uh, and let them know. Um, and then if, regardless, if it passes that, that committee, it still goes to the full uh, Senate. So let your senators know, um, whether you're for or against house bill 1538 and, uh, um, be part of the process. I think one of the hugest things on this, Brett, for me is I always thought my voice didn't matter. Um, what I've learned in the last two and a half months is it's absolutely amazing who will listen to you if you stand up and are honest. 
I think more people need to speak up. Uh, you know, as outdoors people here, we're, we're terrible at it, I think, at times. because <clears throat> We've said this many times on the show, and we're trying to be more vocal on this show about things that matter, too. And all of us just want to go out and hunt and fish, right, and just get away from it all and relax and, and do everything. But it's important to stand up and speak your voice if you want to continue uh, these traditions and pass them on down to the next generation. So uh, okay. I appreciate you coming on and talking about this. We'll have more with Jeremy Olson coming up on the podcast here on Sporting Journal Radio. You'll find out where you can watch or listen to the rest of this at sportingjournalradio.com. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye. And they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Looking for winter adventure? Might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes. Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertillakescountry.com. All right, continuing here with Jeremy Olson on the podcast, um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the people that have opposed you and opposed this bill, because there are some people out there, and what the the reasons for it and and what what might be in there you know, to appease those people. Obviously, it's it's all about trying to keep everybody happy, and sometimes that's impossible. But, you know, if somebody has a concern that it's going to bring a lot of attention to a lake, it's going to bring a lot of uh, fishing pressure to a lake, because that can be a legitimate concern when, you know, people talk about Mille Lacs. When, when Bassmaster went to Mille Lacs, everybody, all the locals were all up in arms about it. Oh, my gosh, you're going to put a national spotlight on this world-class fishery, which it's Mille Lacs isn't really a seeker when it comes to bass, but <laughs> <Are you> sure? <laughs> they were definitely worried about the additional pressure that the lake was going to get. And uh, that was a couple of years ago. So far, it seems like it's, it's held up just fine. Um, I, I, I don't know that personally. I don't go fish it for bass or I don't really go fish it much at all. But um, w- you know, when it, when it comes to people that are, that come up to you, it sounds like you had a bad incident at Sakakawea. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I've had I've had a handful of bad incidents. Cock, we have had a lot handful of bad incidences over the phone, mostly on this bill, um, and and part of it is the one thing that surprised me with folks that are opposed to this is um, when I started this whole process. I'm new to it. I'm I I don't play a legislator on um, at all. I don't don't know the process. I've learned um, a lot in the last couple months and. Uh, and part of what I started doing just because of who I am is I started calling the people that I knew would be opposed to it and, and to give them my perspective and ask for what I'm missing. And, sure. and I had a few handful of people that, you know, it was, you had to hold the phone away and, um, and the yelling and screaming and swearing and stuff was just like, wow. Um, I just called to ask your side of this, you know? And so that was confusing. Um, and there, and that, that was a small number of people, you know, two, three. Um, there's definitely some people that are heated and frustrated about it. Um, I think the biggest problem that I'm seeing is there's a lot of people that are so used to the way that it's been that they don't understand that we wrote the bill to help them. And, and so, and if there's one thing that's kind of frustrating for me on this side of this is, is when somebody says, well, we can't lose our 10%. I'm like, but you're getting 90 more percent and and so that that part i don't quite understand um but the bigger the bigger frustration and the bigger part of it and i think um i don't know if this is what you were referring to but if you've read my testimonies from before um i i'm the farm kid from north dakota that got told you have to leave north dakota you have to learn your trade and come home and for 12 years of my life i lived um in minnesota and and I came home on vacations and fished my same water that I grew up fishing. I've fished the same water I'm fishing now. And I was treated completely different because I had a Minnesota license plate mm-hmm. on blue plater. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of those evil, evil blue plater. And, 
and what's frustrating to me is um is one i guess i apologize for anybody i acted like that before i went to college <laughs> you know because i'm but i really wasn't part of the fishing scene like i said and but then and then what's what's crazy now is in 2005 i fell off a fire truck and got burned and spent three years learning how to walk oh wow and, and um and it wasn't any of these guys that live on Lake Sakakawea that came and took me fishing while I was learning how to walk. It was a professional angler that came and took me how to, took me fishing and got me out of the house and got me out of the wheelchair. Um, it's some of the same professional anglers that the people are upset with now are mentors of mine um, who have helped me get through and deal with the PTSD from getting burned and being a volunteer firefighter. And so I think one of the things that's tough for me and that nobody gives me credit for on this bill is I'm not pro big fishing tournament. I'm pro people that cared about me. And, and, um, and, you know, when you're talking about some of those bad experiences, unlike Sakakawea is one of the most embarrassing things for me is when some friends from, Minnesota came to help me through PTSD stuff and we're out on the water and we get treated like crap and swore at because we have a Minnesota boat that's shiny from a professional angler. And then you get treated like garbage at the fish cleaning station because it's, you're from out of state or whatever. And nobody took the time to realize that that's a group of people that spent their time and their money to come and help me. And, and this is the group of people that, um, um, that in testimony, we, who's going to pay for those out of state people to come here? Who's, um, um, the words buying acceptance for tournament anglers has been used multiple times. And as a North Dakota resident, I don't understand how we can accept that level of, um, um, discrimination, um, uh, that level of, of, um, uh, whatever those words are it just doesn't make sense to me um and and so and then the other part of it is uh fishing pressure uh, here's the one that's funny is it be, being that i'm in sound video and lighting production that's how you and i know each other um i get to go out and pre-fish and shoot video with these guys for some of the national trades and different things like that and you know it's funny because everybody's worried about these guys pre-fishing and using up all their fish well pro anglers with the electronics now they go out and they pre-fish with electronics. They they fish without hooks because they don't want to catch anything until the day of the tournament. They only keep what they catch for the tournament and or what they're going to eat that week. And um, and what I know is that I, as a resident of North Dakota, I'll go fill my freezer with fish, and I'm putting more stress on the fishery than any pro angler that I've ever been in a boat with uh, working. Um, just to feed my family because our our hunting and fishing licenses come out of our grocery bill every year and so so that yeah. that that's that's the perspective i come at all this from and uh it's just uh it's tough when somebody says that well you're just you're just one of those pro anglers who wants to you know fish for big money and be part of uh you know drive around in your shiny boat and uh, my only question is was, where did i misplace the shiny boat <laughs> well, and I, you know, I lived in North Dakota for a long time and I, I definitely saw some of that. And, uh, especially in the, in the waterfall world, man, they do not like Minnesotans coming over. I, I shouldn't say they, I should say there are, there are a few, there was definitely a lot of welcoming other hunters and residents, uh, that were, that were very welcoming, uh, to non-residents to come over there, but there, but you're also limited to two weeks to come over there to do any, any waterfowl hunting. And it's tough for me. And there's a new, there's new regulations in Manitoba now that are going to further restrict non, non-residents to protect the resource for, for the residents. So it's a, it's a, it's a big topic right now going on a lot of places. You look at South Dakota uh, on the waterfall side, again, there's a, there's a draw for a, you know, lottery for a, a waterfall license over there. And I, I tell you, we knocked on a door one time, and we were from Minnesota going to hunt in South Dakota, and uh, 
the landowner was, was great and let us hunt his property, but he said, coming here from Minnesota, if you would have had a duck boat behind that truck, I would have told you to turn around and get out of my driveway. <laughs> and, you know, so there, there is some, you know, some, some concern by local residents to make sure that their resources are protected and, and that they're available for those that live there, work there, pay their taxes there. And I understand all of that too, but there is the, the, the economic benefit to it. And, the, and then I, I see it in North Dakota too. There are a lot of people that don't like to see people make money off the outdoors. So they have, it's, it's not even just a non-resident thing. It's just a bias against, Hey, the outdoors are out here. Shouldn't be exploited uh, for this or that. But you know, the, uh, there's a lot of benefit to fishing tournaments in the sense that it introduces a lot of people to the sport, gets people excited. I mean, it gets me excited about bass fishing. Say what? <laughs> hold on, hold on. Re rewind the tape. Say that one more time. <laughs> because it adds an extra element to it, right? Like I grew up bass fishing and I don't do it much anymore, but now you watch these guys on TV and it's kind of exciting. You know, I'd rather watch a bass tournament on TV than, uh, you know, than a, a football game half what? the time now. Now, hockey's a different. You just said that? Hockey's <laughs> different. Holy well, smokes. It hell just freeze over. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but I mean, again, it you know, it's it's something and it's kind of fun and it's kind of exciting. And yeah, there's there's money involved. And and I, I know exactly what you're saying about um, these pros pre-fishing and not catching fish or taking the hooks off or using all their electronics. You can spot fish now so often and, and locate schools and on spots and you don't have to catch them anymore to find out where the fish are. It's interesting. We recorded an interview with uh, with a Bass Lee Pro that's going to be coming up here uh, maybe next, next week, week on the show. Pat Schlopper, and he told us a story about fishing the, a recent Bassmaster uh, tournament, and there were locals there just kind of hovering around the spot that he had found fish, and he the, the like he was worried, and they were there. I think they were there every day, and it was a, they were catching largemouth bass, and you can keep ten. And it was two guys in the boat, and they were keeping ten largemouth every day to take home and fry up. <laughs> And uh, I just like I couldn't believe it because you don't hear about people keeping bass much anymore to eat for one thing. But, uh, you know, it's the locals that were taking the, the resource, the fish out of the resource and the tournament anglers obviously catch and release. Now, there are some tournaments where big fish get get killed after the tournament. And I would like to see those tournaments go away. So there, there is there is some some impact, I think. But uh, obviously, uh, there's definitely some some pros and cons to everything. So in in this I mean, in this bill, Jeremy, to appease, you know, that side, when you start talking about no conservation fee, which didn't always necessarily go to the resource anyway, uh, having the ability for the local clubs to retain 100% of their proceeds from a tournament, you're saying that this is actually going to help the resources more than the previous previous yeah, regulations. Um, in the last 10 years, uh, that 26% of of uh, tournaments that I was talking about in um, I think, I think it's an average of 2019 and 2018 is where that 26% number comes from. Um, in the last 10 years, those tournaments would have had 780 some thousand dollars that they could have chose how to spend. Wow. And as opposed to sending 10% off and, and, and all of them are good causes. Um, I think I think there's a huge word that we haven't got to talk about yet in this in this podcast, and that's the unintended consequences of a 40 year old rule. And it's it's hurt student angling. Um, it's uh, it it kept uh, it's been keeping the online fishing tournaments out of North Dakota uh, for just weird reasons, mostly because people haven't caught up to the technology and what it means. But what's cool about an online tournament is you can have 50 people fish a tournament on a Saturday and they can be at 50 different lakes. So yeah. one of our issues in North Dakota is, is the, um, is boat ramp um, congestion and an online tournament eliminates that boat ramp congestion. So that's, that's why we made sure that that was in there. Um, but there's another quirky thing that if you take everything that you and I've talked about today, um, requiring a 75% payout does two things. It, it keeps money from good causes. Um, and, and keep in mind that the original rule was you had to be a charity and not a for-profit entity could never have a tournament until like 10 or 15 years into the rules in North Dakota. Um, but it also has required all North Dakota tournaments to have people fish for money. And, and what's cool is you guys are in Minnesota. Um, my favorite tournaments, uh, charity tournaments is when I can go fish against somebody. And, um, uh, the look on my son's face the day that 
he got to go through a prize tent and pick up a 50 or hundred dollar prize. Um, he was so excited, not because he got a 50 or hundred dollar rod and reel combo. He beat Ron Linder. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> he, That's he, took, he took 12th place or fifth or he, he took like fifth or sixth place, but Ron took seventh. And, and so he's, he's fishing for those bragging rights. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm good friends with, uh, a handful of pro guys and I would do anything to, uh, to say that I was better than Johnny Candle or Jason Mitchell or P Jim Carroll today. Uh, I don't care how much money I get. Yeah. Uh, because we all know, I think one of the other things that people don't realize is that if you want to make a million dollars in tournament fishing, you need to start with two and nobody's making money tournament fishing in the U S um, right. uh, and, and every tournament angler I know that's making their full-time job fishing has multiple other jobs and tournaments are just one. It's, it's what gives them their platform. It's not where they're making their money. Right. Yeah. They've got some other sponsorship yeah. deals or they've got yeah. a product that they, that they use while they're, they're fishing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and then one of the other unintended consequences, I think that most people don't realize is, is it's, it's been hurting our communities, you know, and, and it's been, it's been supporting this attitude of this is my spot. This is my water. This is my boat ramp. And, um, the way things have run for 40 years has promoted that. And, uh, and so the goal of this bill was to, it was a handful of things. One was to open up the dollars so that we could raise more money for conservation. We could raise more money for charity um, to get rid of the requirement to fish for money. Um, the other goal of this this legislation was to cut down on the administrative costs and the administrative requirements for game and fish because our North Dakota land management agencies are underfunded. Um, they don't have the, the resources or the manpower. So one of the huge thought processes into this bill is what do we do to limit their their administrative costs and i think the number that i've heard um was forty thousand dollars that it costs to administer 133 tournaments in 2022 that's 300 dollars a tournament what do we need to do to to get that down and uh so a lot of these things that we've put into this bill were to eliminate a lot of those administrative costs which is another unintended consequence of a 40 year old rule. So with these new, these new, just the fees would go to game and fish and help offset those costs. Then. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I, I was going to, you know, I brought that up with Greg last week too, is talking about where these new, where the, where the permit fees would go and yeah. making sure that uh, the resources are still getting, getting protected. Yeah. So the, the local communities are going to be able to raise funds and retain all the funds that they raise with their local tournaments to uh, help take care of, infrastructure boat ramps fish grinders yep. things like that uh so you're going to have some of the local resources are still going to be protected you're going to be able to raise money to offset some administrative fees for game and fish mm -hmm. and you're going to be able to introduce kids to hunting and fishing you know and that's that's i think the biggest thing when you talk about people who oppose non-residents coming or you know worried about all the added media exposure on a certain area or body of water i mean when you talk about devil's lake or sakakawea missouri river things like that i mean those those aren't secrets no you know those aren't i mean putting a tournament or putting you know putting extra media exposure on those places you're not it's not really going to change much people are going to go there anyway and you know the local economies are going to benefit from additional anglers coming in and those are fish factories you're not going to fish out those lakes and north dakota game and fish I, I think there's two other things that are important for people who are weighing whether they are weighing what side of this bill they're on uh, one is the north dakota game and fish does a phenomenal job with our fisheries um the reality in north dakota is our fishing pressure will never hurt our fisheries uh, mother nature is in charge so when yeah. we have good years and bad years 99.9 .9 of the time it's a mother nature involved thing when walleyes are stunted and having issues it's because of drought and flooding situations and it and what happened to the food because of mother nature uh, we can have the best perch fishery in the world uh, on a pothole someplace and mother nature will winter kill that lake and now we get to start over um it doesn't matter in the fishing pressure. So that's one. Two, um, we made it very clear through this entire process, and we and a lot of the, the parts of this bill that confuse people 
is we made sure the game and fish still has control of the fishery and managing tournaments. Um, I think that's one thing that gets lost. We do not, we appreciate what game and fish does um, for managing tournaments. And, and the fact that if you have a, a family reunion tournament or something like that, that's been going on for 20 years, um, some big company can't come in and say, Hey, we want to have our tournament at this boat ramp and push you guys out because we're bigger and have more money or whatever else, um, you know, which is part of that discrimination we were talking about. But um, it's, we're not taking any of that away from game and fish. They've done a great job with that and they, they need to continue to do that. And, and the fishery needs to be protected. That's their, that's within their, their jurisdictional responsibility and their, their mission statement for their, for uh, game and fish. And so we don't want to take any of that away from them. That's, and that's not the intent of this bill. The intent of the bill is to get rid of, the limitations on money is going to conservation charity, the limitations on high school angling, the limitations on new technology. Um, and, and that's, that's what this bill is all about. So what about, I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is, uh, the number of tournaments that <laughs> are available because in Minnesota, they do, they do restrict how many tournaments of certain sizes can be on a certain body of water. Uh, mm -hmm. depending on where you go. Is there anything, is there anything like that currently? And is there any change to that in the new bill? Um, no, that's, that all falls under game and fish. And what um, uh, I think one of the frustrations that a lot of people have is there are some um, rules and restrictions and things that game and fish has that aren't public knowledge. You can only have X amount of tournaments in certain areas of Sakakawea. Um, and so, so, and that's 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 what their job is, and so this bill does not restrict any of that whatsoever. Um, in 2022, we only had 133 tournaments that actually happened. So we have, at the end of the day, we have a very small amount of tournaments compared to other states. I know uh, um, Michigan in 2021 had 3,100 and some bass tournaments alone. Yeah. In the state of Michigan, um, that doesn't include walleye, crappie, or musky uh, tournaments. Um, and so, so it's not, this isn't about, um, trying to get a whole ton of tournaments. We're not trying to be Michigan or anything like that. Um, it's so game and fish has all, they still have control over all of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we statistically have way less tournaments sure. than most places. So, and then here's the other, the other fact that I didn't know until the last three or four weeks, um, in 2020, um, uh, uh, f forgive me. I can't remember if it's 2022 or 2021. Um, half of the people that fished a tournament were on the ice, hmm. you know? And, um, and so, so at the end of the day, we only have about 6,000 people paying and, and that's not individual people, but 6,000 times somebody bought an entry fee for an on the water event and 40% of tournaments were local tournaments with less than 50 people in, in that in that year so game and fish basically has discretion if they yep. say ah we yeah, there's already a bunch of tournaments on that lake they could yep. turn down an application yep, yep. and that's and, their job and and nobody is arguing that as part of this bill okay so that that could still be yep. in place all right uh, well and, and i i guess a great as i was part of a charity tournament years back and somebody came and wanted to have their tournament on our our, on our body of water the, the same weekend that we did and um our little charity tournament um took precedence with game and fish and i appreciated that then and i still appreciate that now that this larger tournament that wanted to come and have our date was told no and so yeah, we totally appreciate that well it's a complicated uh situation yeah. of course but in in reality it looks like uh i i would say from what who i've heard from i mean i heard from a lot of people after last week's show and it sounds like for the most part people are in favor of this new bill and it's it's just something that probably needs to be updated and we need to be able to get more kids out on the water and introduce them to fishing and the biggest thing is we need as a whole as a you know as a as a group of anglers or sportsmen and women, whatever, we need to find ways to limit our infighting because there's strength in numbers. And we need to ensure that we're not bickering so much amongst ourselves that something happens and, and an opportunity gets taken away from us. 
Now, I'm not going to say we all just need to get along no matter what. There's going to be some disagreements along the way, but we need to find ways. We need to find ways to work together uh, to find amicable solutions for everybody so that we can all go out and enjoy fishing and pass it on down to the next generation. So, Jeremy, um, is there is there any place if somebody wants to read up more on this or learn a little bit more about this and 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 try to you know research it to make a decision to, to contact somebody to talk about it? What what do you tell them? Um, you know, um, I think the best thing right now, uh, the best single source is to go to ND uh, the legislature. The Leg- North Dakota legislature website um, and look up House Bill 1538 and and read all the testimony get get all the sides um, that are there uh, because that's that's the best place where everything's coming together and and like I said in January when I came home uh, from North Dakota or from uh, from working in Florida and uh, I didn't know half of what I know now and I'd been researching this for 12 years and. Yeah. Uh, and it's and and I'm just I'm finding out all sorts of stuff. Even even this morning, uh, I found out five or six other things that I'm like, wow. I wish I wish we somebody would have shared that. Um, here's a frustrate. You know, uh, um, things that people don't take into consideration when we're talking about this is the frustration of the county um, maintenance guys that are overworked and don't have enough staff, and their job is to put boat docks or keep up with the Corps of Engineer water levels. You know, it's, there's, there's a ton of frustrations and a ton of money being spent in these local communities, um, that this money can go towards with the new bill that are, that are positive for the local communities that are making all this work. And, um, and, uh, economic impact to a local community is huge. Um, and because if, if my business is successful, then I have more money to donate to taking kids hunting and fishing. Um, because, um, the only reason I know how to hunt and fish is because of the, of the guys who stepped in and filled in for my dad, who, I mean, like I said, we, we camped, we cooked over an open fire 12 months out of the year in North Dakota, but he, you know, he couldn't catch a fish or kill an animal to save his life. Um, (laughs) So so it was those guys that stepped in and helped me back then. Um, And I, I, you know, it's, I want to do that for other people. Um, And I got, you know, I wrote a book on how to take kids hunting and fishing because you know, everybody says take a kid hunting and fishing, but nobody tells the parents how. And so that's, that's, that's something that was passionate for me. So that's why I wrote the book that I did. And, and, and so I, you know, the more that I can help people do that uh, freely without, uh, without all these barriers, then the better, the better it is for the sport. And that's Campfire's Kids in the Outdoors, the one behind you there? It is. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And, uh, and the whole purpose of that is to teach adults how to take kids or new hunt anglers or hunters in the outdoors. So, well, we'll link to that house bill 1538, uh, below in the comments. If you're watching this on YouTube, we'll, we'll link to it in the description here below. We'll put it on our website too. And, uh, can we buy that book online, uh, Jeremy? Yeah, any place you want to buy a book, you can buy it online. If you want, if you want a signed copy, you have to go to shopmissourisecrets.com. Shop Missouri Secrets. We'll put that link below too. Uh, Jeremy Olson, uh, appreciate the time discussing all of this and, and helping us uh, wade through some more uh, more layers of this issue in North Dakota. Uh, and good luck with the book. And thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks very much, guys. Hear more at SportingJournalRadio.com or wherever you get podcasts. Live Target, the leader in Match the Hatch, is back with new lures that also match the action. Introducing the Live Craw. The Live Craw is irresistible to bass, walleye, and other freshwater species. f winner, the ultimate frog, looks and acts just like a swimming frog. With an exposed ultra point mustad hook and replaceable legs, the ultimate frog has two styles, two sizes, and eight colors. And I cast an f winner, the live shrimp, mimics a fleeing shrimp for saltwater anglers. Coming soon from Live Target.